Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Kennedy, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and this is part two of my series, What is Science? And this, of course, is going to cover how do we science, or what is the process of science? And you know, most of us know this as the scientific method. So, you know, science is a way of thinking. It's a way of doing things, right? So the scientific method, that's a process used to understand the natural world like these pelicans at sunset. This is where I grew up in North Florida. So what exactly is that process of science? You know, how, how do we science? I like that, how do we science, right? At its heart, you know, science is about curiosity. Really, it's a desire to know. It's about understanding the natural world. Now, in today's world, or modern world, we have a, a pretty solidified process. Now, it's not a, a rigid way of doing things. It's a guiding principle of how we understand the world. But here's a few of these guiding principles, right? Like I said, the scientific method is not this set series of steps that are in stone, right? It's just this guiding principle, like I've said. But science begins when you make observations, when you begin to ask questions about the natural world, right? Uh, here's some of my friends that are fish biologists, and they're in a small stream in New Mexico, and they're very curious. Who's in that stream? How many are there? What are they eating? When do they reproduce? So they're studying fish in a stream in New Mexico, and they start asking all these questions. And that's important. I mean, that's why science relies on curiosity. You got to want to know what's happening in the world around us. So science, though, to actually science we're gonna do a little bit more than just ask questions because Aristotle was really good at asking questions and he would think about the answer and say, that is my answer, I have spoken. I got that line from the Mandalorian, I have spoken, right? That was great. Okay, but science continues on a little bit more than just I have spoken. We formulate hypotheses. Now hypothesis is a crucial step in doing science. And, uh, you know, they need to be testable and things like that. Okay, so we formulate a hypothesis. And here's me, you know, a few years ago, we were in Honduras. And we were trying to find this really rare lizard called Anolis John Meyeri. And I'm, of course, contemplating where we might find that lizard based on what we know about Anolis lizards. Hmm, I'm not guessing. That's important. Wait, am I giving away the answer? What is a hypothesis? An educated guess, a proposed explanation for a set of observations, or a prediction of an outcome, or could it be either of the above? Hmm. Hmm. Ah, a hypothesis. It's a proposed explanation for a set of observations, or a prediction of an outcome. Now, do you see that bright red? Do you see the bright red? It is not an educated guess. I know. We have been taught from like age zero that a hypothesis is an educated guess. I have no idea. I'm not guessing. I'm proposing an explanation or predicting an outcome based on previous knowledge. Right? That's important. Um, what is it? I'm not guessing. I'm predicting. I guess you could call that a guess. But no, I'm making a prediction based on prior knowledge. This is important. Um, I don't even know what it means to have, be educatedly guessing. And I hate that term, educated guess. So in this class, I'm going to white, we're going to get rid of that educated guess nonsense. You know, the hypothesis is this proposed explanation. Now, now importantly, hypotheses have some very important properties that make them scientific. And there are two requirements. Two, get these down now. And they have to be at least potentially these requirements testable and falsifiable. There's got to be, at least potentially, some way to test your hypothesis and potentially falsify it. Now, if you're right, then your hypothesis is not falsified. I know that's really weird. It's not falsified. We accept that hypothesis. And that's an important point. Science is actually going out to test our hypothesis, and we're trying to disprove them. And the ones we don't disprove we accept and we start to say, well, this is the way it's working. Our hypotheses are, are well supported by evidence and data. So that's a 
that's another one of those things that might be challenging the way we think about things. We hear science is proving stuff all the time. It proves facts. In our next lecture, I'll talk about what a fact is. And yes, science does prove facts. But if it's a theory or something, we're, well, we're having them well supported. Interesting, huh? Okay. So how do we go out and test our hypotheses? There are different ways. We can make additional observations, collect data by doing observations, or we can do a manipulated experiment. And of course, manipulated experiments are always the best way to do something, but they may not be practical or ethical, so we fall back on observations. And of course, this is a, a, an experiment where each one of those little cattle tanks is an independent replicated experiment. Isn't that wild? Yeah, so there's like 24 of these. We're carrying on 24 experiments simultaneously where we're manipulating one or two of the variables. So experiments and observations. As I was just saying, you know, these have their pros and they have their cons. As my dad, yeah, um, he's at the candy aisle and he's making a very tough decision on what candy he should get. And he's not exactly thin. So he's making a poor decision because he's going for more candy. Now, the thing about this is, uh, I use this as an example because it might not be ethical to do an experiment on a large group of people, having them eat a bunch of crappy food, bunch of candy and processed food all the time. It's just not because you can cause harm to them. So experiments definitely have their limitations. So we use observational data. When we do experiments, or we actually don't do experiments, but we want to test a hypothesis about the role of junk food or a bad high sugar, high fat processed diet versus a diet high in fruits and vegetables and grains, the Mediterranean diet. Well, we can't really do an experiment because if you assign people to these two food groups, you can cause harm to them. So we can't do the experiment, it's unethical. So we do observational experiments. We can also do if it's too expensive to do a large scale experiment. So yeah, we don't assign people to different groups. We just track what people eat and then we correlate their weight and their health outcomes with that, uh, uh, with the observations. Now there are limitations to observational experiments because you're not controlling all the variables and manipulating the one that you're testing for, you get what is called a correlation. And as any first year uh, person in statistics or, or somebody will tell you, correlation does not equal causation. And most of the time, most, they're correct. Not all the time. Okay, here's an example. This is number of pirates versus global climate change. If the number of pirates in the world has gone down, global temperatures have increased. It's correlated. Pirates have nothing to do with global climate change. That would be an example of a correlation. So in this case, the correlation between climate change, the surface temperatures, and the number of pirates is completely unrelated, right? So they're, they're correlation, not equal causation. However, however, sometimes it, the correlation does mean causation when there's no alternative explanation. So if you're eating lots of junk food and you're gaining weight, well, that makes sense. Junk food is very high in calories. We know that you have a base rate metabolism that burns a set amount of calories. We know that people store fat if they are taking in excess calories. So we do know that the correlation between a high caloric meal or a high caloric uh, diet of lots of fat, sugar, and, and other processed food that will lead to weight gain, that will lead to vascular disease, that will lead to obesity, that will lead to diabetes for some people. And the reason why the correlation is right is because that goes with what we know about our metabolism and how our body responds to excess food. And when people diet and eat healthy food and exercise, they often have much better health comes. And like I said, that corroborates with what we know about the way our body works. So in this case, the correlation it is on the causation, right? Okay. Now here's an important point. Anecdotal evidence doesn't always support a hypothesis. Now you get sick or get a cold. Somebody goes, oh, take zinc or, hey, you know, if you take uh, um, vitamin C, that'll prevent getting in the cold. Taking lots of vitamin C will prevent colds. That doesn't work like that. That's 
anecdotal data, whenever we look at large segments of the population taking vitamin C, there is no difference between mega doses and small doses of vitamin C in how somebody gets a cold. So wait, that's anecdotal data. It's, when somebody tells you that, it, it, it doesn't work. And I have to go for us New Mexicans here. Hey, green chili, it's the bacon of the vegetable world. Hmm, you'll hear me talk about this more as my lectures go on. But hey, did you know that green chilies have way more vitamin C than citrus? Green chilies are one of the greatest vegetables in the world. Actually, it's a fruit. Hmm, diet Mountain Dew. Yum, sweet nectar of the Greek gods. Oh yeah, I like Mountain Dew. Here's an example of a logical fallacy based on anecdotal data. Every day, I drink a diet Mountain Dew. That's my observation. And you know what? I've been very fortunate. I haven't gotten COVID. Oh my gosh. I mean, if I drink diet Mountain Dew, it protects me from getting COVID. It must work. That's an example of a logical fallacy that I'm correlating my daily intake of Diet Mountain Dew to not getting COVID. And you know what? I also haven't gotten the flu. I also haven't gotten a cold. Hmm, must be medicinal Diet Mountain Dew, right? I'm a single data point. One of the reasons why I haven't gotten COVID is because I have socially isolated for the last year with my wife and two kids. And then now I have teamed, quarantined with my parents in Florida who are elderly and also are very, very safe. I wear my mask when I go outside. I don't go to the gym. I haven't, it's the first time in my entire adult life I haven't been to the gym. I don't go to restaurants anymore. I quarantine. That's why I haven't gotten COVID. But the problem is that I, by saying, by drinking Diet Mountain Dew, that that is somehow preventing viral infections is wrong. For one, it's just based on a sample of one, right? And the other problem was, Oh, I mean, brominated vegetable oil sounds like an interesting ingredient to Diet Mountain Dew or yellow number five or caffeine or water, dihydrogen monoxide or sucralose. But none of those chemicals or any chemical in Mountain Dew would in any way prevent a viral infection. So that's part of the problem with anecdotal data and the logical fallacy of, well, it worked for me, it must work. Now, sometimes anecdotal data, we can go out and test that and see if it does work or not. And we've actually tested plants for some of that stuff. Now let's go to experiments. Now experiments are usually the best way to test our hypotheses, right? Because we can control the variables and by controlling variables, we can uh, get at causation. And you know, experiments have been done by the first Greeks. Uh, this guy named Eratosthenes, he was a pretty awesome dude. He was a polymath, which means he was into just about every aspect of learning there was not just lots of different types of math, right? We're talking astronomy and natural history and geology and the arts. And he made an important observation. And he realized that there's this town called Syene, which is down the, uh, down the Nile in Egypt. And then he was up in Alexandria at a library, Library of Alexandria. And it was reported to him that the Syene, this post, cast no shadows at midday on the equinox, no, I'm sorry, on the solstice, and that a post in Alexandria would cast a shadow. And he goes, hmm, I know geometry. Well, the earth must be round. So he measured the distance between Alexandria and Syene. He measured the length of the shadows, and guess what? He correctly calculated the circumference of the earth to within a couple hundred miles, and he did that over 2,000 years ago. That's amazing, isn't it? but he didn't experiment to disprove the flat earth. There's crazy people out there that believe in flat earth. I don't understand that. In our everyday world, here's some anecdotal evidence, but this anecdotal evidence supports what we know about diet, exercise, and our health. In 2019, I moved out of Albuquerque into the East Mountains, and the trails are right next to our place. And I hiked about five to seven miles almost every single day. I'd wake up at the crack of dawn and go for a hike in the mountains. And over a few months, I lost 15 pounds. I got down to like 172. It's awesome. So my question is, can hiking cause weight loss? Because it worked for me, would it work for others? So in this case, you can design a manipulated experiment and go out and test and whether or not hiking can lead to weight loss or exercise in general. 
And so I made the observations. I, I lost weight while hiking. My question is, does, does exercise cause weight loss? And of course, we can go out and test this. Now, being just me, that is anecdotal data, but we can go out and test this anecdotal data. And it is, like I said, it does match up with what we know about diet and exercise. So you can go out and do an experiment. Does exercise cause weight loss? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna formulate some hypotheses. Now remember, they have to be testable and potentially falsifiable. Now, one thing we come up with is a null hypothesis. This is important. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no effect, right? No effect, not doing anything. Hiking has no effect on weight loss. And then we come up with our alternative hypotheses. Hiking causes weight loss. Hiking causes weight gain. Now, the nice thing about this is that we can both test them and we can falsify them. So here it is. Hiking causes does not cause weight loss with our Eric Cartman, or we can look like beefcake Eric Cartman. Hiking causes significant weight loss. Hmm, significant, significant, hold on to that. It means something. It doesn't mean I lost a lot of weight. It means that the weight loss that I experienced during that three months was not due to random chance, that it was actually caused by the hiking. And of course, uh, our alternative hypothesis too is that it causes significant weight gain. And once again, significant doesn't mean I gained a lot of weight, but that the weight I gained was caused by the hiking. And that actually, that actually happens to some people. Okay, so you would get a control group. You'd have 100 people. You wouldn't let them hike. They'd have their regular life. You have an experimental group. Make them hike 100 miles a month. I know that sounds like a lot, isn't it? I'm at 80 for the month of January already. And it's the 18th of January, so I'm doing good. So we could assign our, our test subjects to one of two groups to control, and then the experimental group, and then we measure our variables. So our dependent variable weight is gonna depend on how much they hike. And then we can see how much those weights change over the period of a few months. We collect and we analyze the data. And that's important. Analyzing data is important. We have to look at what it tells us. Okay. So of course, if I, if I had some hypothetical results here, you would have a weight loss average of 10 pounds. Those little bars are error bars in the hiking group. They didn't lose any weight. You would look at that and say, it worked. I would too, I mean, obviously. And there's a way that we're not gonna do that here that I'm gonna talk about in my third lecture on the role of statistics, that you would actually test that and put a number of the probability, how likely it was that the weight the, the weight loss was caused by hiking. And you'll find out this would be a significant difference, not because I lost 10 pounds, which is a lot of weight, but because that weight loss was due in effect to the hiking, not random chance. And then from there, we develop our conclusions. If you hike, you'll lose a lot of weight. Okay, now you start the process over. That's science, repeat. Now, one interesting thing here is, um, in the world of exercise, lots of experiments have been done on exercise. And um, the results of does exercise, like cardio, cause weight loss? The answer is actually kind of complicated. For me, it worked. I was hiking 100, 125 miles, even 150 miles in one month. That caused significant weight loss. A lot of times when people do an experiment where they work out four times a week, 20 minutes on a treadmill, barely walking, burn about 150 calories. Then those test subjects are like, ha, I exercise. I'm gonna go get a treat. And they go get a large Dairy Queen blizzard and they intake 900 calories of yumminess, of fat and sugar. And then they go, well, our subjects actually gained weight. Well, in the experiment, they didn't control for diet. So people started exercising and then they would go eat more whether it was a reward or they were just hungry. So in effect, most for most people, if you exercise just a few minutes a day, you're probably not gonna lose a lot of weight, especially if you do not control calorie intake. So um, they say weight loss starts in the kitchen. There's a lot to be said from that. Okay, so we analyze our data. And of course we use the term significant to mean it's not due to random chance. And um, if, if we have a significant weight loss, what we do is we reject our null hypothesis. Recall the null hypothesis was hiking had no effect on weight. 
So if we do and find out that, hey, hiking 100 miles a month causes significant weight loss, we falsified our null hypothesis. We rejected that based on data and we accept our alternative hypothesis. Hiking does indeed cause weight loss, or at least a lot of hiking. And um, we use statistics to determine whether or not the results are significant. And in fact, there's a whole field of statistics involved with testing hypotheses, which um, I'm not gonna get into here, but you can see the differences. Eric Cartman on the left would of course be the null, then alternative one and two, he lost weight or gained weight. Okay. Well, that's been another episode of uh, Tom Kennedy Science. And stay tuned for episode three. How do we analyze data?